100 giant dominoes standing in this line. You're going to use your incredible mental math power to work your way down the line and add up all the pips on the dominoes, but there's a catch. After 20 seconds, I will knock over that first domino and we all know what happens next. And trust me, they, they fall really fast. You'll have to give me the total number of pips before the last domino falls. Chris, are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Your challenge starts now. Domino, domino, domino. Three, two, Thanks oh yes! Being here. Thank you for having me here. Yes, we can answer that question. That is Mike Tyson. That, that you is saw. Mike Tyson. Yeah. Which I in the, immediately in the green room started talking to you about because it's amazing that he's a part of this. What was it like when you found out that Mike Tyson was going to be with you on this on this ride? I think every cliche answer for anybody who's plus or minus eight years of me is Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Um, and I think there's a reference to this in one of the Harold and Kumar movies. Somebody tweeted this at me, and I don't remember it. Um, but I was like, oh, yeah, Mike Tyson. Like, I, I have that video game somewhere in a him? box. Did you ever beat him in the video game? Did I beat him? No, I was terrible. I was terrible. Uh, I actually ended up... Did you beat it? I replayed the video game when I was in college because I guess I had nothing better to do sure. for a weekend. It's also a good I, game. And I ended up beating him. I was very, very nice. I was extremely proud. But I had to keep doing the crack code to go back to him. Okay. So I could keep trying <laughs> yeah, over yeah. and over again. Yeah. Uh, but, it, I mean, that, it was very exciting to meet him and, and to work with him. Yeah, he's he's show. hilarious on the show because he is stunned and amazed by everything that that is done. Yeah, and he's also uh, he's not scared to be self-deprecating, which is sort of my sense of humor from time to time. Uh, and he also, I mean, look, you're a world-class boxer, you know the training that goes into that, but he also knows kind of the mental element, which is what the show's about. So it mm -hmm. contributes a lot. Were you excited when you got the uh, the sort of pitch to be a part of this show? Because we have lots of competition shows, lots of sort of reality contestant based shows but with yeah. this it's much more i would say it's about it's about a kind of like important talents people who are good at science good at math yeah. good at very specific things that we don't really uh, glorify that much in popular culture yeah i mean I, that was actually my first question when i heard about the show was uh how real is it you know because i'm not really interested in hosting a reality show that's 80 percent fake uh, i love watching them but i don't know that i want to necessarily host that and they said no Did you dare get on this stage and mock ninja warrior uh, my friend. i'm not oh. mocking anything <laughs> because i will watch it forever um i mean i like that kind of tv as an as an audience member i just wanted to you know i, I hosted a show for discovery channel a few years ago about uh about young engineers young american engineers and that was a lot of fun to do and so they said no this is actually real you'll see when you do the pilot that it took a while to find these guys we shot a pilot that became a two-hour special for fox and then uh and then it turned into a series so i was really excited because especially now right you turn on the tv everything's overwhelmingly negative and divisive um and then here's a show that comes along that these you know these producers wanted to make sure that we're rooting for these humans you know i don't know their political leanings so all i know is where they're from in the country and the cool stuff they can do and uh and that was they a know lot of yours fun. oh they know mine of course <laughs> but it's not a show about politics which, which was very nice did anyone get you backstage when they come on the show and you're like they're the nicest person and they get you backstage and like i gotta tell you something about that obama and you're like uh let's just do the no let's do I, the games i think most people are civil in real life it's only like on twitter where they just want to troll you which i'm sure feels very good like i've done it to people too obviously <laughs> it feels great but no that's what i like about the in-person conversations it's it's very difficult to yell and scream at somebody if you're like having a beer with them yeah absolutely after I mean, the 10th beer maybe but every now the and then level. it can rise to the level of yelling and screaming yeah. but because it was in person you'll eventually come around right. like, sorry yeah. about that yeah yeah so you start doing superhuman what are, what are some of your favorite uh say favorite skills that you've that you've been in contact with there are a lot of them uh i'm kind of a sucker for the math and science stuff um particularly math uh, math and memory actually uh i am not very good at math which is embarrassing and i you know i want to get better i read a lot of sciencey books i'm a big nerd seeing some of these folks come in um you know there's a guy on tonight's episode 
who um, has, uh, he can add up numbers very quickly. So we have something like 69 dominoes throughout, life-size dominoes like this big, throughout the entire studio. And uh, I give him a 20 second head start. And at 20 seconds, I hit the first domino. And he's got to count every single pip on each of the dominoes before the last one falls. So he's running and counting, and that's what, a quarter or a third of a second for each one maybe, um, until he gets to the end and then he has to give me the total. And he gives me the total, but then when you talk to him, so yes, he actually does it. I shouldn't necessarily give it away, but some, some of our contestants <laughs> fail at what they're supposed to do. Uh, but he gives me that, that total, and I'm just sort of like, that, that's crazy that you can do this, that you can actually do this. But what's even crazier is when Mike and Dr. John Dale, who's our, our neurosurgeon on the panel, ask him questions about how he does it. And he ta- he was, I think he talks with Christiana Milian about the training that goes into you, you can train your brain to do these things. It takes an hour or two a day, and after six months, you'll notice a certain benchmark. And that's the kind of stuff that I really like about this show, where it, some of these people are born with this stuff, yes, but the vast majority will teach you how you could train your brain to do it. Train your brain, but also, I mean, just talking about seeing the actual outcome of practice and hours of practice. Like you said, yeah. it's the Malcolm Gladwell thing, right? Of right. 10,000 hours makes you a professional, as cliche as that kind of has True. become now. But it's amazing to see that in practice yeah. and to see how that can actually work. Yeah, no, and, and this is a show that really, very few of them will say there's no practice required. Even if they were born with a particular skill, they tell you how to hone them in and how to keep them active. And so, some of them who maybe just do them as party tricks or maybe do them when they're, when they're doing a YouTube video or coming on a show like this, they'll talk about the training that goes into it. Like, oh, have you explored? We shoot in LA. Have you explored LA? No, not really. I'm just staying in the hotel room, you know, getting prepared for competition day, which is, which is nice to hear. Well, can the Domino's guy count cards as well? If you put him on a black table? I think table? he can. I think we, we were asking really questions skill, about that, wasn't probably. <laughs> um, but he's, he's a good example of the, all, all these folks like that, that old overused adage of you seem like you'd be fun to grab a beer with. I mean, that's the cool litmus for a lot of these folks is they're not, you know, I, I like to say we're like American Idol, but for nerds or for people with, with weird brain skills. And, and that's kind of why is that we're not like none of the, very few of these people are very showy. So they all show up and they could be the guy who works at the bank or the stay-at-home dad or the, you know, the, the nurse. And you'd never know that they have all these other skills until you grabbed a beer with them or saw what guys like this do. When the contestants aren't particularly showy with the exception of their skill, does that put a lot of uh, pressure on you as the host to sort of make it seem more showy and make a, be a bit more of a showy host? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, sometimes they're a little socially awkward and that's okay. That's kind of my job then is to like bring stuff out of them. Um, but that, that's all, there's also a beauty to that, right? Like, going on TV is a weird thing. And we, the show is real, but they have a day, uh, each episode has a, a rehearsal day before, where they obviously don't know the numbers that are being added up or the, the specific challenge, but we go over the blocking of where the camera's going to be, where am I going to call you out, you know, where should you stand? And that's, if you think about it, that's, that's got to be really nerve-wracking because on top of that, you're also adding up crazy numbers or contorting your body or, or things like that. So uh, so talking them through that helps you get to know them a little bit, and the vast majority of them are very sweet and awesome. And then there are a couple who are like, oh, you're super weird. <laughs> All you've been doing yeah. is counting things in your brain, and this is the first time you've talked to someone in months. It's, no, it's actually not that. The, those folks are very sweet and, and, uh, and really friendly. It's Tyson, isn't it? It's no, it's, I don't want to call it out, but you'll see like the ones that, that have a very showy personality, you know, that are used to kind of doing this as a party trick. It's not that they're bad people at all. They're, they're very fun to watch. They just know they're always on. They're like doing the, the slick thing. And I'm like, just, you need to listen to where your mark is for the camera. Otherwise tomorrow you're going to get thrown off. Like, I'm not going to get thrown off. I do this all the time. But that's a very, a very small minority of them. Most of them are just, like, so in awe of, of being there, and, and they make the conversation They're easy. Like child actors, it sounds like, really. The like- former category? Maybe, yeah. But again, it's such a, it's such a minority compared to the, the majority of them, yeah. When you first started acting, did you ever think that you would become the host of a, of a show like this? I feel like no. no one becomes an actor or gets into acting and thinks, one day I will <laughs> be on a stage and I will be introducing uh, you know, people with superhuman skills. Well, or just being on a stage with Mike Tyson, period. Uh, no, I didn't think that at all. But uh, I grew up when Carson Daly was, uh, was hosting TRL, uh, TRL Live, right? Is that what it was called on MTV? Yeah, yeah, Total Request right? Live, yeah. yeah. I think it was called Total Request. 
TRL, but they never actually called it Total Request. Did they? Right. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, and that was so iconic, right? He's he's a couple of floors above Times Square, and that's just a thing. Talking to the Backstreet Boys. Yeah. Right. And feigning interest. <laughs> They're very. I catchy. thought he was. Uh, I thought he was. I, I thought he actually was interested. He was good. He was very good. So I didn't think. No, I didn't think that I would. I would be host. And it's also the the. I think the nature of different media have changed so much. I'm a fan of documentary filmmaking. I love that form of storytelling. I would put this in that same category where I feel like you know what I like about fictional storytelling is that you bring an audience into a world that they would otherwise never get to enter, meet characters they would never get to meet in real life. This is a different version of that. I mean, how often do you meet eight people or six people in a row who? have these kinds of weird brain skills uh, and, and how do you get to know them, know their background, see how actually normal they are. It's a form of storytelling that I think is is unique and that we wouldn't have had it 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Absolutely. You're also in uh, Designated Survivor with I am, yeah. Sutherland, right? What is it like? Obviously, this show is a fantasy. It has, you know, very little, if not any connection to how politics or the administrations actually work, but what is it like to be a part of a show right now in probably the most watched, I think, administration, with good reason or not, <laughs> uh, I think in our lifetimes? Um, it's interesting. I mean, look, on the, on the one hand, we are an entirely fictional show, and uh, the concept of the show is real. There is something uh, called the continuity of government, and so there is an actual designated survivor, a member of the cabinet, in the uh, in the line of succession, is the that president. Warren Hatch for us right now? It no no. Well, it it varies each. Uh, no, Ryan. Each Ryan's time. like third or fourth. In line. Yeah, but I mean on the executive branch side. Oh. On the there there's one cabinet agency usually for a State of the Union or a major address who sits it out and is in an undisclosed location. And the premise of our show is that uh, there's a terror attack at the State of the Union. The government gets wiped out except for the lone the designated survivor. Uh, who is Kiefer Sutherland, and he was the home, uh, the housing and urban development, the HUD secretary, who then suddenly so it would be president. Ben Carson. Well, now, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. So Ben Carson becomes president, and uh, and it's actually a lot better than what's happening now. No. Somehow, uh, <laughs> he actually listens when someone says, "Just don't tweet this, please." And he, okay, <laughs> but so the we the sh show is set up entirely fictional. The the, uh, the barometer that I always try and use for our show is, you know, you want everybody, I obviously have very strong political leanings, but you as an artist, you want everybody to enjoy the show. And so if you're making a political show, then you've got to tell complex stories, otherwise it's not particularly interesting, right? And I remember the, the, the barometer was when this, the very selfish barometer, by the way, I don't, I'm not speaking for all our writers right now, but the uh, second Harold and Kumar movie, the Guantanamo Bay one, there's a, a very funny comedian named James Adomian, uh, who's Great. in prosthetics, plays George Bush, and gets stoned with Harold and Kumar. And while we were shooting this, I'm thinking, I just hope people don't think we're making fun of George Bush, because we're not. And I would hate for in a polarized environment for people to think that, because this, this is supposed to be fun. And I met a year, a year after that, I met people who worked in the actual Bush administration. And they were like, hey, man, this shit was so funny. I'm like, oh, really? Like, yeah, uh, that, was, that was awesome. Uh, we all, like, the senior staff thinks it's really funny. I'm like, oh, sweet, great, because that was our intention. That's what we wanted, right? We wanted people to just be able to laugh and, and diffuse some, you know, kind of divisions people have. That's kind of what, at least selfishly, I want to do with Designated Survivor. All of that said, I also consult on the show. And uh, one of the first things I told my writers was I said, look, in terms of a press secretary and the relationship with the press and the administration, your press secretary can never lie. Otherwise, your entire administration <laughs> loses credibility. You know, the second that you tell one lie, nobody's going to trust anything else that you say. I'm like, oh, OK. And we premiered under the previous administration. I kept <laughs> citing examples, you know, Josh Ernest, uh, things that he would say. And I would say, see, he's either telling the truth or he's not sharing information if he can't disclose certain things. So like, okay, no, we get it. Day one, Sean Spicer, of all things, is arguing about crowd size, right. clearly a metaphor for something else. And I was like, this is, I, I email my writers, Here just so you know, this is not normal. And if you have any questions about this, come to me because he's going to have a credibility problem in the next three weeks or in the next month. And then, you know, essentially replaced by... But Sarah Huckabee Sanders, is that her name? Who's yeah, she's even worse. Essentially, she's essentially replaced him at and this he is, point. Yeah, but, and, but, shut, and shut the cameras off. Even today, it was another audio-only briefing. Yeah, well, I definitely see if this is why I'm glad that fiction doesn't follow fact, because then my character would kind of get cut out of the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> but but I think that's that's one example of like you know the, the relationship with the press that previous administrations have had gone through different iterations, but it generally assumes that you know we didn't kick Fox News out of the room, even though they were 
telling completely crazy stories about us. It's part of the narrative that you have that back and forth in the give and take. So that's the one piece of it, I think, as a consultant on the show, uh, that you always have to, at least I always find myself feeling like I should remind folks that there is a structure that has been in place for a long time with checks and balances um, that we shouldn't disrupt just because there's something crazy going on now. And we shouldn't normalize the now and ignore the last however many years of the way things were done. But the now, I mean, if we go back to that first day of Sean Spicer, and this is the moment where we're just going to do this now. <laughs> if we go back to that first day with Sean Spicer, where we say this is not normal, yeah. and the goalpost has moved here, right? We're now five, four months in, four months in, and the goalpost has consist considerably moved even further with yeah. no cameras allowed in the briefing, the thing with, with him in the bushes, the lies that Sarah Huckabee Sanders is just thrown out like she is even worse than Spicer in some in some respects. Mm -hmm. How do we go back to some place later and say, no, no, back here was the normal. Let's get back here. Like how do we know that these goalposts aren't moved forever? Oh, you're talking about in terms of the actual politics of it? Yeah. I mean I think it, it'll depend on the next administration, you know, if if president they're not law you know, uh, they've just kind of shifted what the normal is. Sure. They've, well, they've shifted the normal, and also anything that was law. There are uh, uh, a number of examples, if you look, that the executive branch also has control over penalties for people if they break the law. And I think the Hatch Act is one of those examples where there are a lot of people getting warnings now. But really, where's the enforceability? Who's going to enforce those rules? And I think that's a great question, because if the goalposts continue to move, I think it is up to the collective us to say, this is not normal. And it, it, it also doesn't, I mean, it doesn't help the, the current president, whoever he or in the future she may be, to have that kind of antagonistic relationship with the press. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not helpful to anybody. Um, I think every administration has felt like some aspects of the press were deeply unfair um, or decided to tell stories that were better for selling ad space than for actually, you know, telling the American people what, what a policy item was. Um, but that's kind of the, like, the give and take with the press. So I, I think it's a good question that those goalposts are going to depend on future administrations. Do you have hope that future administrations will not just sort of act in the way that the Trump administration or sort of react to the way that the Trump administration has moved the goalposts and will just sort of keep moving it in that direction? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, who knows where rock bottom is with these guys in particular. But I am I am hopeful again because I think generally speaking, it used to be that you could disagree with somebody in a very civil way. You know, you have friends who are on the right or on the left, and you can have those conversations about things, and you can have them respectfully. And now it seems like there are just no rational actors on the right. Um, and that's what's troubling. So I do have a lot of hope, because I don't think it serves the right well either in the long run to behave this way. Certainly not the left, and there are, you know, sometimes bad actors on the left too. I'm not saying that one party is, I'm still an independent, by the way, so I'm not saying one party is overwhelmingly better than the other. I'm just saying... The issue of rationality and, and the concept that there are rational actors in these conversations is something that we need to return to, and I'm hopeful that we will. Can I ask you a hard question about all this? When sure. we talk about the irrationality of the, of the right, which I agree with completely, does it feel like to you that they're acting as if they don't have to worry about losing power in future elections? Because that's my big fear right now, is that they are moving the goalposts so much, they are acting so brazenly. I mean, just taking health care away from people, yeah. you would think, is, 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 uh, is third rail. Like, well, if, I, if I take health care away from my constituents, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my, my seat somehow. Sure. It seems to me that there is just a brazen lack of fear in regards to even p the potential for losing power. Yeah, I, I don't know which which side of brazen they're embracing because I would agree with you. This is a, this is an administration that is so far out there, so far to the right that you would have, you know, even two or three years ago, you would have said, even if he became the nominee, the Republican party would not wrap its arms around this guy. There's no way they would do that. And now here they are not just wrapping their arms around him. I mean, like they're like inside of him. They're like in bed. They're, you know, they're hugging so close. They, they love, this president, the entire Republican Party, loves everything that he's doing. And that's kind of unsettling. She'd tweet a little less, though. Huh? I mean, come on. You can't, you, you can't say, right? You, yeah. you can't it have those arbitrary crazy. lines, right? The McCain lines, you know, the McCain and the Graham lines of like, oh, I wish he'd tweet just a little bit less. Right. And, and I, uh, you know, I, I would liken it to, I enjoy that they are willing to be upfront about how they feel. Um, and you don't have to guess, you know, it's sort of like you go to your friend's house for dinner and like the grandma looks at you kind of weird and I'm like, I would rather have you just say it. 
<laughs> then wonder the whole dinner. And then the grandma turns out to be really sweet and be like, oh, that was on me. But, you know, the, the like, but I, I, would, I would love to know the, the clarity of that. And they're offering us that clarity right now. The Republican Party is saying we are 100% with anything that Donald Trump does, even though in the past we may not have been. And so they're going to, you know, that may be very successful for them or, or it may not be. I hope it's not. I don't think it will be. When you were in the Obama administration, did you, were you aware of and did you notice how the great lengths that the administration went to to make sure that there was transparency, to keep people informed, and to also do things by the book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't even know where to start with that. There are little things like, you know, releasing visitor logs uh, seems like a very small thing, but if you think about it, it... it it's huge. It is huge because you can... You can see who's who's there and who's not. I remember, you know, the 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 foxes of the world, and I, I think even others. Um, when I when I was working there, they said Obama administration officials are secretly meeting with people at the coffee shop across the street from the Starbucks so that they don't have to disclose that they came in during the records dump. Now we were meeting with people across the street at the coffee shop, not because we were worried about the records dump, but because Secret Service for for Public Engagement Office at that time required. Uh, 24 to 48 hours to clear somebody's name because you have to submit your social security number and stuff before you come into the complex. And because we were meeting with so many more people than previous administrations, they didn't have the capacity at the time, not a lot was digitized, believe it or not, to uh, to get all those people into the building with the proper clearances. So we said, that's fine. Let's save you that trouble and let's go meet across the street at like a coffee shop. And it was very, you know, Think about that. You have that much transparency, and people take it for granted so much that they're criticizing a meeting that you take if you want to actually leave your office to take the meeting. Totally fair to, to wonder why people are meeting across the street. Not really that much of a secret meeting. You're no, it's not. Shop. If the, I know, and this is my point. Contrast that with now and the things that we don't even talk about because the other stuff is so crazy. There was a lot of transparency. I think, you know, I, I, I think the, the president believed in that transparency and believed that the American people deserve to know certain things. Um, they may not be convenient for him and, and maybe that's okay because maybe things are, you know, things are only going to move forward if, if you have that kind of transparency. There are other things that are national security related that you can't share. Um, but the things that you're talking about, I think that they've dialed back so much are, are, are a little ridiculous and a little scary, I think. When was the last time you talked to uh, President Obama? Uh, I saw him about a month and a half ago. A month and a half, two months ago. Just, just hanging out? No, just I chilling. stopped in. I have a lot of friends who still work for uh, for his office. Uh, and so I stopped by to see my friend Cody. And uh, he happened to be in the office. So I stopped by to say, hey, he looked great. He looked very relaxed. We didn't talk about politics. Uh, really? What are you talking no, about? I, we just talked about family and, oh. and how have you been since. Like, you know, when's you the next Harold and Kumar coming? <laughs> <laughs> We're looking forward I wish, to yeah. <laughs> Let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a question? Right here. Hi. Hi. I'm Dominique. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Dominique. You are such a versatile actor. You have excelled in comedy and drama and now hosting. And you've also held separate careers completely outside of the world of acting. Can you please tell us a little bit about how you transition between projects and how you juggle such distinct positions and roles? Sure. Great question. Thank, thank you for asking it. I wish, there was, I wish there was some sort of a master plan or a map that I could tell you about that would offer how that all happened. Um, you know, I, it, the way I got involved in, uh, in public service was in 2007, when I was on House, there was a writer strike. The screenwriters had gone on strike, and so we couldn't shoot any more episodes. Um, and Olivia Wilde, who was on the show with me at the time, was going to an Obama event uh, in LA and knew that I had liked his book. I think he only had one book out at the time. Uh, knew that I was not a Democrat or Republican and said, do you want to come? And at the time, uh, you were not you were an independent? I'm still an independent. Oh, okay. uh, still Wikipedia re registered says independent. Democrat. Well, wi as we know, Wikipedia is not uh, anybody. My, by the way, my college buddies still try and, uh, try and put stuff on Wikipedia that's like inside jokes from school, knowing that journalists use Wikipedia for some reason to do research on people. Tell me why. And uh, it's easy. I get it. But it's not. So, so there's all the stuff in there about like random inside absurd college jokes that journalists will ask about, like, what was this thing? Like, I know who put that in there, and it's not a real thing. Uh, but so uh, Olivia had asked if, uh, if I wanted to go to this event, and I had the chance to hear uh, then-Senator Obama speak and kind of followed his campaign since. And then in 07, when the writers went on strike, went out to Des Moines, Iowa. I was the first state to have a caucus, their version of the primary, uh, first out of the, out of the states. Uh, and we didn't think... Uh, the senator would win the state, but he did, and then had the chance to go to 26 other states for him. The writer strike ended, uh, you know, the campaigns ended, he ended up winning, there was an opportunity to serve 
uh, and I obviously, you know, you don't really say no, but there was no plan. And my manager, uh, who I've been, you know, he's represented me now for like 15 years, said, do you, are you going into politics and that's it? And I said, no, I would love to do this for a year. And then after a year, uh, three of the things that I cared very much about that we were working on, or four, hadn't, uh, hadn't been done yet. There was uh, the DREAM Act, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal, uh, increasing the Pell Grants, which is money for college, uh, and uh, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, neither had gotten through because politics is very slow, and it's slow on purpose. So I said, I'm going to stay for an extra year. Uh, and then again, he was like, are you sure? Because this is sort of like athletics. Like, the longer you're out, you know, the harder it is to get back in. And thankfully, at the end of that second year, um, I was able to get a get a gig on, on How I Met Your Mother as Robin's boyfriend, which was so fun. That's a great show. And those those guys are all so nice in real life. And they all get along very well. It was very sweet to see. Uh, and then from there, having a chance to come back to acting, I thought was, you know, honestly, thanks to the fans for that, because I don't think otherwise I would have a chance to to work. So I wish there was a calculated path. I think it's just a lot of thanks to the people who allow me to do these ridiculous things. How did, um, I don't remember when, you know, when you started working in the, admi in the administration, but I'm curious how you remember critics on the right responding to a cast member from Harold and Kumar sort of working in the Obama administration. Because we have this experience right now. I will, you know, gladly say I'm a person of the le on the left. I'm a probably far left Democrat. And when I hear about the people that Trump is putting in his administration, I hit, my hand hits my head and I'm freaking out. They're all like weird reality TV show stars or like uh, sleazy lawyers from Russia or something. And, it, and, it's, and it's terrifying. But when you were in the Obama administration, I was like, that's cool, he's probably smart. But I imagine <laughs> critics on the right were freaking out about it and were... Yeah, I mean, I don't know that they were freaking out about it. I think, uh, first of all, I don't read that much about myself. I think it's a little... Or right-wing news. Weird, or right-wing news. But there were a couple of, you know, I think there were a few, there were a few critics, and I think that's, that's fair that you can be curious about somebody's private sector career. I think the, the nice thing is there are literally thousands of people who leave private sector jobs to serve uh, in various administrations in different capacities, and then they go back to being teachers or doctors or whatever they were before. So it's not like I was the only one, but yeah, I was the only one who maybe was from a particularly public job beforehand, so there was natural curiosity. Um, but I don't think the left media was any, you know, they weren't any great supporters either. I remember doing a, doing a, uh, part of my uh, agreement with, with House when I was leaving, you know, I, I had no beef with the show. We got along really well. And they were kind enough, David Shore, who created the show, was kind enough to find a way to write me out so I could go serve the president, which is a ridiculous sentence, by the way. Talk about things that you wouldn't have told yourself as a kid. That's ridiculous. Uh, but uh, that, whole, that whole process, there was part of the agreement was to do some, a couple of shows, a couple of cable shows. And there was one that should be re re remain nameless. And I said, look, if we're going to talk about, if you're going to ask me about going into politics, which I understand, let's stay away from any of the deliberate questions about things like marijuana policy. Because I know you would probably love to, but if you don't mind, I just want to be, and not because I want to shy away from it, but just out of respect to the people who have just hired me, I'm about to enter a job where I don't want to be a distraction. I want to keep my head down. I want to do good work just like everybody else. And so this show, which is on one of the left cable networks, I guess the only one, they put up like every, every clip of Kumar smoking a joint <laughs> and ran it literally side by side with my interview. And so in the bottom of the screen in the corner, I'm seeing this like just literally high as shit talking about the 2008 election and youth policy going, this is so not good. Oh, this is really going to undermine things. It didn't because I think the, the bottom line is people who uh, I worked with in the White House, I had already worked with for like 18 months before on the campaign. Um, and so you just kind of brush that stuff off. And I don't know. I mean, I, I hear this stuff about people in the current administration. I don't know. I mean, I, I hear, you know, you asked me backstage about Omarosa. I mean, she worked in the Gore administration uh, for Vice President Gore. She apparently is very tough and, and has the chops to carry out jobs. I know she's very close with the current president, so I assume she was probably a great hire for him, knowing the types of things that, that he wants to do. I don't know her personally, so I don't know. I tend to not look at things through that lens, just because, like you said, it could easily be, you know, I could fall in the same bucket. Absolutely. Next question. Hey, Cal. Uh, my name is Kunal. First of all, huge fan. Um, Thank so your name is Kumar? Kunal. Oh, okay. <laughs> Kunal. My last name is Kumar. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk a bit about Indian Americans in Hollywood. 
Um, as a filmmaker and with my Indian actor friends, I've seen a lot of stereotyping and discrimination for roles in Hollywood, with the typical Indian accents to the 7-Eleven store owners. Um, do you see this landscape changing with more actors coming from Bollywood, like Priyanka, uh, and things like IFA happening in New York, or do you think it's going to take time before that change comes? Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, I would view what you're saying as two different questions. I think you're asking about Indian Americans in the entertainment space here, and then you're also, also asking about a Bollywood awards show. So those, those are two different things, right? Because I think, and this is something I think, unfortunately, uh, a lot of performers of color struggle with a lot, which is having to remind casting directors and producers constantly that we're Americans first. You know, I was born in New Jersey. Where are you really from? I'm from New Jersey. You don't sound like you're from New Jersey. I'm like, get me angry. I'll sound like I'm from New Jersey. So stuff like that, 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 uh, that you know, we constantly remind folks for. So I actually think as, as you have more and more... Um, Americans entering these fields in writing, producing, acting, filmmaking. That's what's going to change it the most. I was talking about Priyanka earlier today. She is fantastic, and she's built such a global audience. She is such a versatile actor. To be able to go from a Bollywood movie to like crushing it on her ABC show is insane. If you see her on Quantico, she's incredible. She's amazing. You see her in one of her Bollywood films. It's like a completely different person. Um, but those are relatively few. She's, she's very uniquely talented to move between global workspaces. So I think the, the, the bottom line is I wish more folks were going into fields like writing and, and, uh, and producing, yeah. I think I have time for one more question. Hey, Cal. Hey. How are you? Uh, going back to the show, I was wondering, like, do you feel like there was any chance of like, maybe running out of people with superhuman abilities or maybe like, uh, repeating some of the same abilities so that it doesn't get boring? And also, do you feel like you have any of your own? like a superhuman uh, talent? Good question. Uh, if I had my own superhuman abilities, I would not be hosting the show. So I think that's definitely a no, I, I wish. Um, I don't think we're going to run out of, of anything. The, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but really one of, the, one of the big joys for me of the show is how uplifting it is. You know, Like I said, I don't know or care about the politics of any of the contestants. Uh, I know that they're incredible at what they do. They're, for the large part, very humble. They want to share these skills. You, like, really root for them. And I can't think of another opportunity right now that's out there where we're actually rooting for, for uh, fellow Americans. It's an incredibly diverse country, incredibly smart. There are people from all over, 330 million people. There is no shortage of folks who have these incredible skills. Sometimes they do double up because it's, it's interesting, right, to see two people who have memory skills do completely different exercises between two episodes. is actually really fun for me and I think for, for the audience from some of the feedback we've gotten. So I think you'll see some of the duplication, but not because there's a shortage of people with crazy, weird, awesome skills, but because we want to showcase as many people um, as possible. So uh, are you asking a leading question? Do you have a superhuman skill? No, not that I Ah, all right. If you develop <laughs> one, because you can develop some of these, if you develop one, you should, uh, you should submit yourself on, on the website, because they're always looking. If you could develop one, what would your yeah. superhuman skill be? I'm looking at your shirt, waiting for that answer. <laughs> I was just about to say climbing walls, but I'm really <laughs> terrible at climbing. But. If you could develop a superhuman skill, what would you try to develop? Uh, it would be either memory or math related. The memory stuff, very selfishly, would just help as an actor. Um, but the math stuff, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge NASA space nerd. Um, that's probably my biggest hobby. And uh, to be able to better understand some of the physics behind deep space exploration or time dilation would be incredible. It would blow my mind yes. if I could understand any of but, that. And, but you can work on it. That's the thing. There's this great, I think uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and uh, Bill Nye have this thing where they're like, why are we always so proud of being bad at math? Could you imagine another profession or another area of interest? Like, I'm so bad at history. Like, it doesn't have that same ring to it, right? Like, you're bad at math. That's not good. You should be better at math, which is true. So trying to hone my skills based on some of what our contestants have taught us. Cal, uh, when can people tune in to Superhuman? Monday nights, 9 o'clock. So if you're uh, watching this live, tonight at 9 on Fox. Uh, Designated nine. Survivor? Designated Survivor comes back in September right. on ABC um, it was Wednesday nights at 10. I think it should still be. A, yeah, it is still Wednesday nights at 10. We'll see in September. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> Cal Penn, everybody. Thanks, Thank you Cal. guys very much.